Please welcome the second gentleman of the United States of America, Douglas Imhoff. Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so. Thank you so much. It's amazing. I want to. Uh, thank you. I want to extend a special thank you to my friend Ambassador Rice and her incredible team that has worked so hard and everyone else who's worked so hard to pull this historic conference together. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> this is the first conference on hunger, nutrition, and health in 53 years, going all the way back to 1969. So as President Biden likes to say, this is a big deal, everyone. <laughs> And I met, I met a lot of you earlier, but I want to recognize and thank all the advocates who have joined us here today. I see a lot of you out there. Hi. Um, and you know, we cannot do this alone. We cannot do this alone. Hunger and nutrition insecurity are issues that do not get nearly as much attention as they deserve. I know this. I've traveled to over 30 states as second gentleman. So not only did I see firsthand the food lines and those distribution centers that so many of you work so hard at. But more importantly, I've heard directly from families across the country about the impact that food insecurity has had on them from big cities to rural communities. I've seen it all. And during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, I visited those long lines outside of food banks and I spoke with nervous parents who were worried about finding the next meal for their family. And just last month, I visited the Capital Arena Food Bank right here in DC. Say hi. I see you out there. Uh, I met uh, Robin Reese, who serves as the food, uh, distrib food distributor coordinator. And she told me that her outreach program serves over 1,200 families, 1,200 families in the DC area per week. So just think about how many meals that is per day. It's a lot. And now think about that horrible, agonizing thought of having to turn a family away because you've run out of food. It's horrible. These were the thoughts that stood with Robin as she helped families in her role. So when I hear stories like Robin's, I take them right back to the administration. I mean, I live with one of them. Um, <laughs> How was your day, Dougie? Well, um, because we're not just here to listen. We're here to take action. So we're bringing together hundreds of you. Uh, we're going to share our plans to end hunger and improve nutrition. And even more are out there. I hear a lot. Uh, tuning in virtually from home or work, so hello everyone. Um, this Biden-Harris administration is committed to ending hunger by 2030, and you're right here with us. We're continuing to make pro progress towards meeting this goal. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at the Department of Agriculture's Farmers Market with our good friend, Secretary Tom Vilsack, right here in DC, if you haven't been there, it's great. We met with vendors, they were selling fruits, fresh produce, they were growing it right there. So farmers markets, like the one at the USDA, are helping to expand healthy food options by bringing local food, grown right here in the communities, right to consumers. I'm also proud of the ways that the Biden-Harris administration is strengthening food systems to benefit both consumers and producers by, produ by providing more options and increasing food access. The American Rescue Plan is helping to keep food on tables and make sure that no family 
has to make a choice between a meal or keeping the lights on. That is just wrong. <laughs> Through the American Rescue Plan, it has delivered nutrition assistance to millions of Americans. It's been generational. Building on the reach and strength of key federal food assistance programs that we all know, including SNAP and WIC. But it's going to take all of us working together to solve this issue. And I, I got to drop in on some of the group meetings. You're doing just that. So what does it mean? Partnerships. We need partnerships. They're crucial uh, to our success to end hunger. And what does this also mean? It means public-private partnerships. I come from the private sector. I know that full well. We can reach more people, and food banks will be able to sustain their operations longer when we're all doing it together. And we've had an amazing response. 45,000 restaurants have committed to meeting stronger nutrition standards for their kids' meals and serving only water, milk, or juice with those meals instead of soda. We've got the National Restaurant Association that's going to support these restaurants to design healthier kids' menus, and it's going to create a public database to help parents find these healthier options all across participating restaurant brands. It's big. And uh, being a proud Californian, I want to recognize the great University of California. I'm not going to say go Bears because I went to USC, but thank you for what you're doing. Uh, the Cal University of California has pledged to cut in half the percentage of students struggling with food insecurity by 2030. So thank you. Everyone needs to do that. I am so proud to be here today as we take action to implement the Biden-Harris administration's national strategy to end hunger and reduce diet-related diseases. And I know that this is an issue that the president, who you heard from earlier, uh, my wife, the vice president, my great friend, the first lady, and everyone in this administration cares deeply about. So in a few minutes, you're going to hear from young advocates who are on the front lines of tackling this cause. These are young leaders who are setting such an amazing example in their community. And they're going to share their stories and their actions with you. Those stories are going to inspire you, as they have me, to be part of the solution in ending hunger and, and reducing diet-related re diseases. Be part of the solution, everybody. Join us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I'll see you in a minute. Please welcome Carrie Miller Ortiz, Director of People and Culture at Move United. I'm a little slow. I'm getting here, though. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. It is such an honor to be here today with so many who understand the power of collaboration and the importance of making the goal of physical activity for all a reality. When I was growing up right here in DC, my aunt, the amazing woman she is, who I always wanted to be, I think mainly because she was like this tall, you know, <laughs> she was in the army. So that, so service was something that was integrated into my whole psyche from an early age. You know, there's no surprise that when I got older, I grew up and I joined the Army too. I just knew that I was going to be General Miller, right? Everyone's going to be saluting me. <laughs> um, you know, however, um, fate had a different idea. I ended up getting in a car accident where I lost both of my legs. When I woke up, I had just, just one question like that was burning you know, within me was, who am I? Who am I now? During my rehab process, my mother's friend, he said, um, he had me try wheelchair basketball. I fell in love. Uh, that sport not only brought me a new group of battle buddies, but it took me back to college, where I was able to play uh, wheelchair basketball for the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I-L-L? One more time, I-L-L? That's right. <laughs> uh, through wheelchair basketball, I was introduced to my true love sitting volleyball, 
Sorry, honey, I love you too, a little bit. <laughs> I was initially hesitant, um, as volleyball was not one of the sports that was pushed on me, you know, as a black kid growing up in the city, right? Um, plus, I never really felt those little booty shorts, and little short shorts, it wasn't my thing. I was raised Catholic, right? So, it's not my fault. Um, on top of that, it, was not, never, it wasn't something I ever had like a possibility model for, you know, a person who looked like me and who was out there playing this sport. But because of that door that was open for me after injury, I was able to test out my skills, right? And ultimately, I made it onto Team USA. It was, all right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and was named best, liber best player in my position. So, you know, I was totally riding high, right? I ended up having this one coach and he was, you know, he was really, really grouchy. But there was one thing that he said in one of his tirades that, that really stuck with me, right? <laughs> he said, he asked, what do you want your legacy to be, right? I had won medals in 2008, 2012, 2016 Paralympic Games, but I soon realized that medals, they just weren't enough. They weren't enough. So in 2008, I came back to my roots right here in DC and started the Paralympic military program at Walter Reed and Bethesda Naval. This is... <laughs> So that was sharing adaptive sports and all that it gives with the newly injured service members across the, the state. I learned I was far from the only one who struggled, you know, to find myself or a sense of purpose, you know, after injury, to regain confidence or a sense of camaraderie. One day, while we were doing the, the, the training, we had a Marine who had been coming in. He came in regularly and he sat down and played. And, and I asked him, I was like, man, why do you always have such a sour face, right? <laughs> See? <laughs> and he said, that was part of his condition, that you don't smile, right? So in my mind, I was thinking, challenge accepted, right? <laughs> so he ended up, he immediately, I mean, he ended up sitting down, and it was his turn to serve, right? And he throws it up and he aces the other side of the, the court. As soon as he, he hit that ace, he yells, ace, and jumps up and down with a giant smile on his face. You know, and that, that's when I knew that what we were doing here in this program, was, it mattered. Everything that we were doing mattered. It mattered to them. From there, we helped design the Department of Defense's military adaptive sports program, creating opportunities for thousands of veterans across the country. We successfully lobbied Congress to fund a veterans Paralympic training stipend and launched the Warrior Games. So that's the inspiration for Prince Harry's Invictus Games. <laughs> One of my most cherished endeavors was creating the Air Force Wounded Warriors Community Programs. Oh, no, huh? <laughs> Whose mission is to connect injured service members with accessible recreation and make sure that when they return home, they feel like, they, like it's a place where they belong. Those small words, connect and belong, those are key. Often individuals with disabilities are sequestered off on the sidelines watching and cheering because some of the most basic barriers to access still have not been lifted. There are huge disparities in, ac in, in access to adaptive sports. So for instance, I was the only person of color on my wheelchair basketball team, and then again on the US women's sitting volleyball team for a very, very long time. This reflects the reality of across our nation. How do we lift barriers for kids of color growing up right here in DC who aren't very different from me? Or for those kids in rural areas, you know, how do areas far from access for, from gyms? Today, as a director of people and culture at Move United, the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated to adaptive sports community programs across America, I work every day to expand access to the same opportunities that changed my life, that I saw change the lives of injured veterans, and that I know can change the lives of so many other individuals with disabilities if they're only given the chance. So I know what my legacy is. It's to remove barriers to access to physical activity for everyone across 
uh, regardless of disability, economic status, gender, or race. But now I turn to all of you here today and ask, what do you want your legacy to be? Thank you. Please welcome Rebecca Oni and Rocco Perla, co-founders of the Health Initiative. Twenty-five years ago, I asked physicians, what's the one thing your patients most need to be healthy? And they said, every day we have patients that come into the clinic, the patient has an ear infection, and we prescribe antibiotics, but we know that family cannot afford food and medicine, and we don't ask about those issues because we practice a don't ask, don't tell policy. Now, it seemed it shouldn't be so hard to design our healthcare system around what people actually need to be healthy. So I launched and with Rocco led Health Leads, enabling physicians to ask their patients, what do you need to be healthy? And then prescribe those things, fruits and vegetables, and connect them to resources in their community. And then one day I got a letter from Dr. Jack Geiger. He wrote, I wanted to share an historical precedent for the work of health leads dating back 45 years when I and other physicians at the nation's first community health center in the Mississippi Delta literally wrote prescriptions for food for our patients to fill at the local grocery store, which we then charged the pharmacy budget of the clinic. Now when the federal agency that was funding Dr. Geiger's clinic found out about this, they sent down two bureaucrats to tell him that they had intended their dollars to be used for medical care. To which he replied, the last time I checked my textbooks, the specific therapy for malnutrition was food. <laughs> now, when I got Dr. Geiger's letter, I was devastated. Decades prior, he had invented the prescription for basic resources, and then we reinvented it because our healthcare system had gone so fundamentally unchanged in the meantime. And I became obsessed with one question. Why don't we just do what we, need, we know we need to do in order to deliver healthcare in this country? And in pursuit of the answer to that question, Rocco and I hired polling firms to ask people across the country, if you had $100, how would you spend it to buy health in your community? And across race, gender, income, political party, rural, urban, all of the focus groups chose to spend more money on access to healthy food and safe housing on health care. We know that just 20% of what makes us healthy is tied to medical care, as compared to 70%, which is tied to these drivers of health like healthy food. But in this country still, every single day, we spend $11 billion on health care, and we are not yet actually buying health. In 2014, I was at the Delta Health Center when it was rededicated in Dr. Geiger's honor. And there, next to me, were the two federal bureaucrats who famously <laughs> failed to shut down his food prescription program. <laughs> Seeing my surprise, they leaned over and whispered, you see, it was Dr. Geiger who taught us to challenge the rules. Today, 50 years after Dr. Geiger wrote those first prescriptions for food and the first White House conference on food, nutrition, and health, it is time that we change the rules to bridge health care and health for all Americans at last. In 2011, I was asked to help lead a new federal center to transform health care. And while we began to fix the healthcare system, we struggled to address the realities of patients' lives. We talked about medical homes, a way to coordinate a patient's health care, but we never thought to ask if a patient had an actual home. We penalized doctors if their diabetic patients weren't taking their medicine, but we never thought to ask if those patients were making trade-offs between buying food and buying medicine. 
after I left the federal government, I saw food insecurity data for the first time. And I remember thinking, oh no. I've been working to lead health reform for five years in this country, and we never looked at food insecurity data. Since Medicare began over 50 years ago, the federal government has developed thousands of measures that dictate what we pay for in health care. None of those address whether a patient has access to healthy food until now. This year, physicians, community health centers, food entrepreneurs, insurance companies rallied to en enable the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services to create the first federal health care measure that addresses whether a patient has access to healthy food or any other basic resource. That means that 33 million patients every year will be asked before they're discharged from a hospital whether or not they're struggling with food. And that matters because what we measure and what we pay for is the ultimate expression of both what and who we value. This is a picture of me and my mom. I was four, she was 25. My dad suffered from severe mental health issues and struggled to find work. We never, ever talk about this. But one day last year, I asked what happened, and my mom told stories of having to make impossible trade-offs between paying the rent and buying food, and remembers thinking, my family and friends throw food away while me and my baby go hungry. And I asked her, did our family doctor ever ask about food? And she looked at me completely incredulously and said, what's a doctor supposed to do about that? To her, hunger had nothing to do with health care. The truth is, I'm ashamed. Not that me and my mom went hungry, but that I spent five years leading health reform in this country, and I never asked the most important question. What do people actually need to be healthy? It's not complicated. If we're really committed to population health and reducing med medical costs, we need to put the health care system to work for health. Leadership at this moment is about asking if every patient can afford to feed their family and then connecting them to and paying for healthy food. Thank you. Please welcome back Second Gentleman Douglas Imhoff, White House Domestic Policy Advisor Ambassador Susan Rice, Joshua Williams, the founder of Joshua's Heart Foundation, and Avani Rye, Healthy Living Advocate and National 4-H Council. Good afternoon again, everyone. I think we all know that nutrition and food insecurity affect people of all ages and in all communities. And people of all ages and all backgrounds can and should be part of the solution. Now, we're going to hear this afternoon from two amazing young people, people who will share their perspectives and experiences on these very issues. And most importantly, They'll also share how they're driving innovative solutions to address issues of hunger, nutrition, and health in their own communities. And they're mobilizing other young people to help in these efforts. So it's my privilege to introduce Avani and Joshua. We're really glad to have you. And second gentleman, M. Hoff, thank you so much for your participation, your leadership, and your partnership. It's great to do this with you and to have you on the team. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rice. Again, um, we did, her and her team did so much work on this. I got to meet, I think, all of them, so thank you so much. Um, it was great to meet both of you backstage. We got to talk a little bit about the work you're doing and, and why you're doing it, but I, I want to hear your stories, and I know they all want to hear your stories. And Ivani, why don't we start with you? Um, I mean, how did you get involved, especially at such a young age, and um, why is this such a big issue? And why is it so important to you? And then, we'll, and then we'll have the same question. I first saw food insecurity when I was eight. I was eight years old when I first saw food insecurity. And it was because I had the opportunity to be a part of an annual Diwali food drive that occurs in my community, sponsored by the organization Seva International. And at eight years old, I went door to door asking my neighbors for non-perishable food items. I collected, sorted, organized, packed them all. But what I remember from that experience 
is actually going to the organizations and delivering donations mm -hmm. and getting to meet the volunteers and the families that we would help. And that's the first time that I was confronted with the reality that kids like me, families like mine, dealt with hunger and had to deal with that as a daily part of their lives. And since then, I've been most significantly involved in food advocacy and as a healthy living advocate through my work in 4-H as a part of the Illinois Food Advocacy Team and currently as an Illinois Healthy Living Delegate. And my experiences in 4-H have allowed me to focus on not only feeding people, but feeding people well. Yeah. The importance of addressing not just food advocacy, but inclusive food advocacy and making sure that we're ensuring people's dietary needs, their allergy needs are being taken care of instead of it just being whatever's left in the back of the pantry when it comes to food drives. Because we don't have a quantity problem in the country, we have a quality problem in our country. But, but it's true, it's so true that we need to better focus on the quality of our food and improving food advocacy inclusively. I could not agree more. And, um, we, we overheard a lot of the smaller groups talking and that was one of the topics we were talking about. So thank you for that. Josh, same question. Of course. What, um, how did you get here? Sure. Um, my name is Josh again and I started my organization when I was four and a half years old. It all started with a $20 bill that my grandmother gave me. And I was going to church one day. My grandmother stopped, uh, my mother stopped at a red light and out of my window was a homeless man. And at the time, I didn't understand the extent of the situation, but I knew that he needed the $20 more than me. Um, he had a sign that said, need, need money, lost my job, I'm living on the streets. And I wanted to do something about it. And I gave him the $20. And it was the first time that I learned about hunger and homelessness in my community. And it kicked something off in my brain. I wanted to do more. So what I did first was look for an organization that I could join, but I was a little boy and I got rejected <laughs> right away. Um, I was told that I have to be 16 or older to join an organization and um, it didn't make sense to me. Um, so when I started the organization, uh, one of our key tenets was to allow and be, it was to allow and empower youth to make a decisions in our organization. They act, organize, and lead the, the organization. So we started a junior advisory board, a youth advisory group, and we have had hundreds of kids go through the program. They are graduated, we have alumni, they have gone to top 30 schools across the U.S. and now work for four to 500 companies across the U.S. as well. Um, and on the other side of the food relief side, Josh's Heart continues to do that. We have distributions weekly, as well as a pantry. We uh, have done work in South Florida nationally, as well as internationally. And I think as of now, we've probably given about six million pounds of food. We've mm -hmm. raised about $3.5 million so far. Um, and yeah. And uh, to this day still, we impact and use a lot of youth in our organization. We've worked with about 60,000 youth, and they have been able to impact about 600,000 individuals across the world. Um, but in the end of the day, Josh's Heart is really about getting together youth, empowering them, and making sure that they can make a difference. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, that's super impressive. And you, know, you didn't actually tell, tell the audience how old you are. Of any, 17, is that right? I'm 17, I'm a senior in high school. High school senior. <laughs> Joshua, 21 or two? 21. 21, just graduated from NYU. Yes. And what's so incredible about your stories is how each of you got started so young, eight, four, and you've been doing this work now for a long time, and you've seen the, you, the value of bringing other young people into the fold. And so I'd love you to share a bit about what you've learned about how young people can best make a difference. What is the superpower of young people, and why is it so important for them to be involved? I think young people are our most underrated um, organizational asset. They have they tend to be overlooked about um, the amount of change that they can make in their community. They, um, when they're empowered, they can do great, great, amazing things. Our generation, my generation, in uh, 20 years, we're gonna be in the decision-making roles, and it's important to empower and teach kids 
about entrepreneurship, problem solving abilities, and really give them the tools um, early on, not in college, not in high school, not in middle school, but even earlier, to make sure that our future is secured. Um, not just in the US, but internationally. Uh, our generation, the youth, are gonna be the ones solving the future problems. And if we don't teach them properly and educate them right, um, there's probably gonna be issues in the future. And it's important to me, as I've done through my work, to encourage and empower kids across the US. Um, lastly, I think, we're in a very interesting time, um, and we think very differently compared to some of uh, my older uh, co colleagues and contemporaries. Um, for example, my grandmother is, um, she's an immigrant from Jamaica, and she has totally different life experiences from me. Um, I grew up in the most advanced generation in human history, and it puts us in a very interesting spot. How do we work together uh, as different generations? I'm a big fan of intergenerational partnerships. I think magic happens when young people are able to listen to older current leaders' experiences. And, and since we don't have the day-to-day -day responsibilities of adult life, um, we can think a little bit outside of the box and hopefully make some solutions. It's <laughs> awesome. I got a little Jamaican in me too. Just a little. Uh, of an aid. Tell us about how you view harnessing the, the superpower of young people. Yeah, well, you know, Ambassador, I love this question because I feel like all the time when we talk about youth in relation to leadership or to service, we're talking about some future scenario, that youth are the future, they will be our leaders. But if anything, my experiences have shown me that youth aren't just the leaders of our future, they're the leaders of today. Yeah. They're the innovators, they're the change makers of today. I mean, I look at a team like the Illinois Food Advocacy Team in which 20 youth leaders across the state of Illinois signed up to do ground level hands-on work in food advocacy in their counties and then were hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. I remember that very first interview to be a part of that team happened in March of 2020 and the interviewers kept telling us in just a few months, we'll go back to what we were supposed to do. And that still hasn't happened today. And yet, in the midst of such a tumultuous situation, we learned and we adapted. Organizing a food advocacy summit in which youth across the state of Illinois were able to attend and be inspired and motivated to make change. And then we supported that motivation by rolling out $23,000 of mini grant programming with 30 different youth-led projects in 20 counties across Illinois. And that's the power that youth can have. All right, it's time to take action, right? <laughs> and you two are clearly young people of action. It's inspiring all of us. Uh, Yvonne, I'll start with you. What's the top message of all the things that, that you're thinking about, what's the top message you want this entire audience and everyone out there to carry with them as they leave this amazing conference? And then Josh, I'll, I'll kick that one to you as well. Well, I think you're right that this has been a fantastic conference. And my experiences today have shown me how motivated and dedicated all of our attendees are to addressing food advocacy and improving the health and lives of our Americans. But we can't do it alone. It has to be something that we bring back to our communities and that we use to motivate those around us. Because service is infectious the way joy or laughter or happiness is infectious. And when we're able to bring those around us as well, the stakeholders, the leaders, the youth in our community, to do something even greater, that's when we can make a real difference. We live in a country where hunger absolutely does not need to be a problem. Americans absolutely do not need to be concerned about this. We have the capabilities to make a difference and to end hunger. And it's a choice that we have to make, but a choice that we have to make all together. Right. So that's what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. They agree. We just need to take action. Josh, what about you? Uh, my biggest message would be support and nurture our youth. Um, it's yeah. incredibly important that, especially as adults, that you look towards them, listen to them. Um, we are in a different time period and in a different perspective than most. 
Um, and you don't have to agree with all of, all of what we say or believe, but just listen out a little bit. And to our youth, look uh, to our adults as well. Um, they have been through a lot more than us, and they have a lot more experience. Try to learn as much as you can from them. And uh, there's a lot of support systems that are in, in place for us. Use those to spread awareness about issues that are going on in the world. Um, go to your schools, start small, start local, and start helping out. And no matter if you do something that's big or small, if you are going to your local pantry to help out and volunteer, doing a food drive, um, you're really contributing to the larger uh, goal, which is to reduce food insecurity and hunger around the world. And it's really important that we take note of that. Um, and another thing would be, we have to make sure that we're there for one another. Um, as colleagues, as, as, as a community, as Americans, whatever they may be, um, be there for one another, help each other out, support one another. When we have our community pillars and we support them and they're sturdy, um, we can do wonderful things as well. Um, make sure we watch out for each other and um, help each other out. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ebony and Josh. Uh, if I do say so, I think we saved the best for last. Uh, because the young people here, and there are many of you, and I'd like to ask you all to stand up, if you would, please. As Ebony said, you're not just the future, you're the present. And you ground us in why this work is so important. So we wanted to end with the inspiration that, that only you all can provide um, and take this work going forward. I want to thank, again, Second Gentleman Emhoff. You've been a tremendous partner. Um, and thank all of our panelists and participants here today. You've come from far and wide. Um, and you've all contributed here today, but more importantly, what you've done to get here today and what you're going to do going forward. This is not the end. This is the beginning. We have so much more work to do to achieve these goals, and we will. And I want to thank all of our colleagues in the administration, my extraordinary team at the Domestic Policy Council, Many other components of the White House uh, staff that have been so instrumental in pulling all this together. It's a whole of team effort. Our colleagues from across the interagency, all of the agencies, but in particular, I want to thank the folks from Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture who have been so <laughs> instrumental in getting this done. I want to thank our extraordinary partners at Lumina. Productions, who have pulled all this together in record time and done an extraordinary job. Under duress, <laughs> and we're grateful. Um, this really has been a fantastic day. And we've heard from anti-hunger advocates. We've heard with people living with diabetes and other chronic diseases. We've heard from chefs and farmers, health insurers and food company executives, athletes, and so many more. From President Biden uh, and the elected officials we were privileged to hear from here in Washington, from local leaders making change on the ground across this great nation, everyone's stories and contributions have been unique. But one thing is clear. Together, we have the policies, we have the ideas, and the commitment to reduce diet-related disease and make hunger a thing of the past. We can do this. It is in our reach. So thank you, thank you for all you're doing to take on this critically important challenge to end the scourge of hunger and diet-related diseases. Let's leave this conference even more motivated than when we came in the doors this morning. And when we look back 50 years from now and see what we have accomplished, I hope we will view this as a moment that galvanized our nation to nourish our people and live up to our highest aspirations. And now. Thank you again, and let me hand it back to Second Gentleman oh, Thank you, Ambassador, so much. Ambassador Rice and your team, thank you so much. Uh, Joshua, Uvani, uh, your stories, your work, your passion, your leadership, and you are leaders now, it just wants to make me just get right back out there on the road, which I am going to do everything I can uh, to do everything I can, just like all of you are. And I'll continue to travel 
and work with this administration, but also work with all of you, the community leaders, the advocates, the state, local uh, governments, um, organizers. We're all in this together, as the ambassador said, and as the young leader said, and you've heard this all day today. This is, this is a nonpartisan issue. This is an American issue. And we all need to come together on this issue and put politics aside because as a, this is solvable. We've all seen it. We have the food. We have the money. You have the support of the federal government and all the local state governments. You have the support of private enterprise and community leaders. It's just a, a sense of just getting it all together and doing the work, and that's what you're all doing, and that's why you're here. So let's leave this conference as We've said this is not the end, this is the beginning, and let's we'll go out these doors right now and take action, and let's get this problem solved. We can do this together. Thank you all so much. Thank you.